Okay, so I have uh, I have graded the first uh, uh, homework, and uh, uh, for those of you who were not in my class last semester, what I do usually is I grade a few problems, and uh, it's on twenty. Uh, have a look at uh, the mistakes you made because it's always important for you to to understand that. And uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't have much to say about that set of, of homework. Uh, now let's go over this one, uh, 1.3. Okay, so uh, for this question, there is a mistake. Well, it's uh, let, let me uh, what what something which is right that can be said is the following. Um, you can say that there is a rational <coughs> a between. M and M plus epsilon. That's always true. Okay, this is due to the density of irrationals. You can also say that you have an irrational between M and M plus epsilon. However, this does not answer the question. Because the question is find a number in your set A. So uh, this is not going to lead you to the correct uh, answer. Okay? Do you see that? Because the question there is find a number A which is in your set capital A. You don't know where A is, you know it's a rational. That's all you know. So that's not enough. Okay, that's a, that's a, a correct statement, however, it doesn't answer the question. Okay, so uh, that's not the way to do it. I'm mentioning this because I know that several of you uh, have asked me about that. Now, how do you do that? Well, you use the definition of greatest lower bound. And the first step is to say m plus epsilon is not a lower bound of A. That's the first step. It cannot be a lower bound because you say that m is your greatest lower bound. So if you increase m by something, you get something too big. It's not a lower bound anymore. What this means that it's not a lower bound is that there exists a in a such that a is less than m plus epsilon. Okay? If it's not a lower bound, it means that you can find an element of your set lower than this number. Otherwise, it is a lower bound if you cannot find such a number. Do we agree on that? That's a crucial step. So you get this inequality, and the other inequality is uh, trivially true because m is a lower bound. So since m is a lower bound, of A, we must have M less than A. So you get the double inequality by doing that. You have questions on this? So for B, uh, we can do a symmetric thing for upper bounds. 
So this time, uh, we are going to say that for every epsilon, there is A in A, so that A is less than M and strictly bigger than M minus epsilon. This is not crucial. However, note that uh, uh, in both problems, you have a strict inequality and a large inequality. So uh, how do you prove that? Well, so uh, here we are assuming that, OK, so we should have started by saying that uh, M is the least upper bound of it. Okay, that's our assumption. So this should have come here. And uh, then for every epsilon, we can find an A so that this is true. So if M is the least upper bound, it means that M minus epsilon is not an upper bound. Same reasoning as before. You have a least upper bound. You decrease it by something. Well, it's not an upper bound anymore. So if it's not an upper bound, it means that there is A in A. So that A is strictly bigger than M minus epsilon. Okay, And the strictly comes from the fact that uh, if for every A in A, A is less than or equal to M minus epsilon, this would mean that M minus epsilon is an upper bound. So when you contradict that, you get a strict inequality. That's why it's strict here. But OK, it's uh, usually not crucial to for, for this type of question to have the, the strict inequality there. So you have this. And on the other hand, since M is an upper bound, uh, A must also be smaller than or equal to M. And again, we get the, uh, the double inequality we want. OK, so that's for number three. Uh, number six, look at the set 1 over n, where n belongs to the naturals. So first question, show that A has a greater slower bound. Well, obviously, you need to use a fundamental property of the rails. And first thing, A is not empty because 1 belongs to A. Okay, You do 1 over 1, you get uh, 1 in A. And uh, what else? You can also say that uh, you uh, have a lower bound. Or 1 over n is always greater than 0 for every n. which means that 0 is a lower bound of it. OK, so always be careful to check your two hypotheses to use the fundamental property of the rails. Now you can use the fundamental property of the rails, which tells you that A has a great slower bound. Now what is the greater slower bound? Uh, obviously, it's going to be 0, uh, because you are getting closer and closer to 0, and, but you're still above 0. 
Okay, so we can guess that zero is the greatest lower bound. Now, we need to prove that this is a correct guess. And in order to prove that, uh, we first thing, we, we, we repeat here that zero is a lower bound. Then, uh, by contradiction, assume that B, which is strictly bigger than zero, is also a lower bound. Which would mean that one over N is bigger than B for or equal to B for all N in N. which equivalently means that n is less than 1 over b for all n. And that contradicts the Archimedean property. Okay, So not possible by the Archimedean property. So B is not a lower bound. So at this point, we know that 0 is a lower bound, and that anything bigger than 0 is not a lower bound. Therefore, 0 is the greatest lower bound. Yeah, by using the Archimedean property. Yes, yeah, that's correct. So you see, you don't need to write pages and pages. Usually, if you are writing pages and pages, you are on the wrong track. These are simple proofs. But you need to concentrate on something which is short and well explained. Every word you write must be justified. Okay, and mostly your implications. You, when you tell me, oh, statement A implies statement B, always be careful. Is this really obvious? Do I need to justify this? Sometimes it's obvious, just you know, known algebra. You don't need to justify it. But uh, many times it's not, and sometimes it's even wrong. So when you think about it, you it avoids making mistakes. Okay. And stay away from writing very long, uh, convoluted arguments. That's not helping you. Okay, usually you're on the wrong track. Number eight. So one of the ways to do this is to do a proof by contradiction. Uh, well, no, we don't really need a proof by contradiction. So let's see. Uh, so on your scratch paper, what, would, what you're trying to show is that this is a true statement. Okay, you, you know that uh, A is more than B, and you like to show this. Well, there is an N, so it's a good idea like there to have a statement in function of N. So I'm going to solve the inequality in function of N. And then because these are two positive numbers, I know that if I take the inverses, the inequality reverses. But this is the type of thing you need to justify. Okay, that's because the, 
the, the function 1 over x is decreasing on the positive numbers, then you can take inverses here and you get this. So you get that the n must be bigger than that. That's a uh, Archimedean property. There is always a macho which is bigger than a given real. Okay? So now that I have uh, seen what's going on, I can write a clean proof. Okay? This is just how to, to set up the problem. So what I'm going to say is that by the Archimedean property, there is a natural such that n is bigger than 1 over b minus a. Okay, that's my first statement. Okay. There is always a natural bigger than any given number. Then I take inverses. Again, justification is because this is a decreasing function on the positives, and I know that this is positive and this is positive. And finally, it gives me b bigger than a plus 1 over a. OK? Nine. So it's a little easier to see if you do the contrapositive. So you can write that if A is rational, so is a squared. Okay, so I wrote the contrapositive of it. So the proof, if a is rational, it means that a is a p over q where p and q are integers. Then a square is p square over q square, and p square is a natural. And so it's q squared. Okay, because when you square an integer, you get a natural number. Yes? Can you say that can't you say q is natural but not p because p is zero? Uh, right, p could be zero, you're right. So but anyway, we you could use just z again and you'll be fine. Okay? So this tells me, because I'm doing the ratio of two integers, that a square is rational. And that's all we need to do. And then is the converse of a2, meaning if a square is rational, is a rational? Of course, the answer is no. Converse not true. And the counter example would be uh, a equals square root of 2, where we have a square equal 2, which is rational. But square root of 2, not rational. So uh, this is in the proofs that uh, something is irrational. Sometimes people prove that the square of a number is irrational. In the case of pi, for instance, uh, there is a proof, uh, the most the best known proof, let's say, shows that pi square is irrational. And that's enough to show that pi is irrational. Number 10.
Okay, so let's do a proof by contradiction. Uh, assume that A is strictly bigger than B. Okay, we are contradicting the conclusion A less than or equal to B. Uh, then we have that A is strictly bigger than B. So we get B here, A here in our real life. But on the other hand, we want B plus epsilon to, to be always bigger than A. So clearly, you can pick epsilon so that B plus epsilon is strictly less than A. And that's going to be our contradiction. The epsilon you should take, uh, well, there are many choices, but one possibility would be to take epsilon equal to A minus B over 2. If you take epsilon equal to a minus b over 2, uh, that's a strictly positive number. That's the first thing for an epsilon. It needs to be strictly positive. And it's strictly positive because a is bigger than b, according to our assumption here. And then we do b plus epsilon, we compute b plus epsilon, that's b plus a minus b over 2, which is a plus b over 2. <coughs> that is the mean, the, the middle of the segment. And this is strictly less than a. This is strictly less than a because, again, b is less than a. So a plus b over 2 is less than a. OK? So we get our contradiction. We want B plus epsilon strictly bigger, uh, bigger or equal to A. We cannot have that. See, these pictures are helpful. In many of the analysis problems, just draw your real line and see what's going on, how you are going to pick your epsilon. And 11. 11, let's do a contrapositive again. The contrapositive says that if B belongs to A, then B should be less than or equal to T. Okay, every time you take an element of A, it's less than T. Well, this by definition means that T is an upper bound of A. Okay, what this is saying is all the elements of A are less than T, that's all. Oh, there is going to be uh, SI sessions for this class, so this is the information. Questions about the homework? So let's go on to 
The sequence a n is just a function from the naturals into the reals. And uh, if we use the, the function notation, we really should use the notation a of n. Okay, because it's, uh, you assign a number to every natural. That's all you're doing. But the notation for sequence is a n, like this. Okay, so there are many examples. Say a n is, for instance, 1 over n. You, you, that's the definition of uh, this particular sequence. So you can have uh, an explicit expression in function of n, or you can define things recursively. Like you could, you could define a, a1 as being uh, uh, 1, let's say, and then a n as being 2 times a n minus 1. Okay, you, you could give a definition like that of your sequence a n. So there are many ways to, to define a sequence. Now, uh, what uh, our the, the first and maybe most important uh, thing about sequence is the notion of convergence. So we say that a n is a convergent sequence. If it has a limit, okay. So we want to write uh, mathematically what it means to have a limit. The limit is always taken when n goes to infinity. That's the only limit you look at. Unlike what you do with functions, okay. You, for functions, you may have uh, uh, interest in limits uh, outside infinity. Not for sequences. You always let n go to infinity. Uh, so what you want to say is that the limit is L, so you have L here somewhere in your line. And in order to say that the limit is L, what you're going to say is that every time you take a small interval around L, you should be able, after a certain rank for N, to have all the elements of your sequence in this small interval. Okay? Because what you want to avoid is that once in a while you have someone in your sequence jumping far away from L. You want everybody tight near L. That's what you want. Okay? So we are going to write this mathematically. Uh, we are going to have an epsilon because we, we are going to call these bounds L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon. So in order to say that we want what I just described to happen, for any small interval, you start by writing that for every epsilon, that's the, the mathematical notation for, for every strictly positive epsilon, there exists, this is, uh, so this is for all, this is where it exists. There exists a natural number n such that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, uh, let's see, but I haven't defined L here. So maybe we should say that A n converges to, is a convergent sequence, uh, converges to L, to the limit L, if the following happens. Okay, so that's the mathematical definition of convergence for a sequence. You give yourself a very small interval around L, and you can guarantee that after capital N, all 
the a n are in that very small interval. Okay, so let's use our definition to prove a few obvious facts. So first example, let's take a sequence a n which is constant. Okay, it's equal to some c for every n. Then of course a n is going to converge to c. It doesn't move from c, so the proof is to take a, an epsilon, which is positive, and find a capital N. You see, you need to show that there exists a capital N so that this statement is true. In this case, you, you don't have to do much work because you can, for instance, take capital N equal to 1. And then you have that for n bigger than 1, a n minus, so we are trying to show that the limit is c, a n minus c, which is really c minus c, which is 0, is less than epsilon. Okay, in this case, you, you don't have much to do, you just check that for capital N equal 1, but you could have taken 100 if you preferred, uh, you get 0, and 0 is less than epsilon, so you're done. Okay? So that proves that A n converges to C, and this is the notation we're going to use. A little more interesting is to look at a n equal to 1 over n. And the problem with our definition is that we need to know what the limit is before we can prove convergence. Okay? We cannot uh, prove convergence without knowing the limit, which, by the way, is not uh, uh, really required. In the, there are other notions that don't require to know the limit to prove that the sequence converges. But you'll do that later on. So, a n equal to 1 over n, we want to show that this goes to 0. Okay, so here I have to do a little work. And so let's do some scratch work first. Uh, we what we want in the end is to find n so that so. So what we want is find n so that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus 0 is less than epsilon. Okay, that's what we are trying to do. Now, a n is 1 over n. And uh, I don't need absolute values since 1 over n is positive. So I want 1 over n to be less than epsilon. And this is the same as saying that I want 1 over epsilon less than n. And here I can think, well, uh, this is our Archimedean property, actually. Okay, and now we'll be able to do a clean proof. Okay, so this is on my scratch paper, and now I write down the proof based on what I observed here. So I'm going to say let n be bigger. Well, first, first step, we are given ourselves an epsilon. So fix an epsilon, and let n be bigger than 1 over epsilon. And this is, n exists by the Archimedean property. 
Okay, I know I can find a capital N bigger than 1 over epsilon. Okay, so now take any n bigger than capital N, which is itself bigger than 1 over epsilon. This implies that n is bigger than 1 over epsilon, which implies that 1 over n is less than epsilon. Okay, that's again because we are taking inverses of positive numbers. And therefore, we know we need to reverse the inequality. And this can be written as 1 over n minus 0 in absolute value. So I'm done. With this choice of capital N, I have shown that an minus 0 is less than epsilon. Because I can do that for any epsilon, and that's very important, if you're able to prove it for epsilon equal 1 or 2 or your favorite epsilon, that's not good enough. You need to do a proof which is generic in epsilon. So you get this. Therefore, uh, 1 over n converges to 0 according to our definition. Yes? What, what do you got written there between the parentheses? Oh, this thing here? Uh, I know that n exists by the Archimedean property. Okay. I okay. should just read it back here. Yeah, that's, that's a crucial step because it tells me that such a choice is possible. It doesn't tell me how I can find it, but it tells me that it exists. And that's what I use afterwards. Okay. Um, so 1 over n, of course, is a crucial sequence that we use over time. Uh, another one which is important is c to the n, okay, geometric sequence. And um, okay, so maybe we should talk about that. Uh, in order to deal with this one in particular, we need the Bernoulli's inequality. So if you have n a natural, if a is a real, and a is larger than or equal to 0, then one plus a to the n is bigger than or equal to one plus n. If you remember uh, Newton's uh, expansion formula, you see that this is the first two terms of my expansion. Okay, and you, you have n plus one terms, uh, but they are all positive. So by uh, chopping out the other terms, I get a lower bound. That's all we are saying here. Uh, to do something more elementary, we can use induction. Okay, so we do an induction proof on n, and uh, we so we, we should maybe give a name to this thing. So a n let a n be one plus a to the n. Let b n be one plus n a. And the first remark is that a one is equal to b one, which is equal to one plus a. So the inequality holds. Okay, they are equal. So this is a true statement for n equal one. Okay, so it's true for n equal one. Now assume that a n is uh, which which is one plus a to the n is bigger than b n, which is one plus n a. Then let's compute a n plus 1. So a n plus 1 is 1 plus a 
to the n plus 1, which is 1 plus a times 1 plus a n. which is uh, 1 plus a, a n. Now, since a n is bigger than b n, a n times 1 plus a is going to be bigger than b n times 1 plus a. Just by multiplying both sides by a positive number. And so we get an plus 1 on this side, bigger than bn is 1 plus na times 1 plus a. And this we can expand and we get this. And now we get rid of this term, which is a positive term. And therefore, we get something larger when we get rid of it. A smaller, I'm sorry. And we end up with this, which is 1 plus a times n plus 1. And that's bn plus 1. OK? So uh, this proves the, the inequality by induction. So uh, we can we'll be able to use this inequality. Excuse me, before you erase that, <coughs> the bottom line there where you concluded that a sub one is greater than or equal to b sub one, would you have logically concluded that a sub one is less than or equal to b sub yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. But since we are trying to prove uh, this inequality, well, that's what we use. Okay, so uh, the following example, uh, we want to show that if C is a real number whose absolute value is strictly less than 1, then the sequence A n, which is C to the n, converges to 0. The problem we have for this is that n is an exponent now, instead of being like 1 over n uh, as being in a, in a rational form. And so one way to deal with that is to rewrite this as being the following. So to get around that, so the proof of that, is to write that c because it's less than 1, is actually 1 plus 1, 1 over 1 plus a for a positive. Okay, you, so what we're saying here is that we can write our c, absolute value of c, as the inverse of a number bigger than 1. Uh, in order to, to show that, let's just solve for a, and we'll see that we have an a. Okay, so we, we have that 1 plus a is 1 over c, and therefore a would be defined as being 1 over c 
minus 1. You see that because c in absolute value is strictly bigger, is strictly less than 1, 1 over c is strictly bigger than 1. And so this is a strictly, bigger, a strictly positive number. So we are just doing here some, uh, a little algebra trick to get our c to, to be under this form. And you are going to, to see why this is useful in, uh, in our proof. Why I chose to write it like this? Or it's, be, it's because of Bernoulli's inequality. Because when I'm going to look at c to the n, I'm going to have 1 plus a to the n. And 1 plus a to the n, I can compare to 1 plus n a. And 1 plus n a is basically of the same family as 1 over n. And so I'll be able to deal with it. So it's a little tricky. It's not, it's not something you're supposed to come up with in your homework, for instance. But uh, uh, the steps, once you, once you see the trick, the steps are not difficult to follow. OK, so uh, yeah, what, what we're going to do then is the following. Uh, by Bernoulli's inequality, precisely, We know that 1 plus a to the n is larger than 1 plus n a. Okay, there is nothing uh, new here. Uh, we know that our a is positive. That's why we can use Bernoulli's inequality. It's not a true statement if a is negative. Then we take inverses, because these are two positive numbers. And we say that now this is a true statement. which means that c to the n, well, by definition, uh, this is c to the n in absolute value. So c to the n is less than 1 over 1 plus n a. So I'm a, all I'm doing really is comparing a geometric uh, sequence that goes to zero very fast to something which goes to zero much slower. But uh, that this, this form is easy to deal with. Uh, we could do a direct proof for C to the N, but we would need to use logs. And uh, since we haven't introduced logs yet, we, that's why we're doing this. Anyway, so now. Uh, what we're going to do is, yeah, we, well, we, we can uh, simplify a little further this thing by saying that this is less than 1 over Na. Why can I say that? Why is this a true statement? Yes? Since Na is less than 1 plus Na, then 1 over Na is greater than 1 over Exactly. It's because I know that this is bigger than that. So when I take inverses, they are in reverse order. That's all. So we have this. Now that we have this, we can imitate what we did for 1 over n. This is basically 1 over n. There is only this a, which is here, but that's a constant. So I'm going to include my constant. And what? so now we are going to fix epsilon. And we are going to say let and be bigger than, uh, so what do I need? 1 over a epsilon. OK? Again, it's uh, the Archimedean property that we are using. We can find a natural number bigger than 1 over a epsilon. Uh, now take n larger than capital N. And we are going to get that c to the n minus 0 is c to the n, which is uh, 1 plus a to the n, which 
here we have uh, by this uh, sequence of inequalities we ended up that the, this thing is less than 1 over Na. Uh, however, 1 over n is less than 1 over capital N, and 1 over Na is less than 1 over Na, and uh, Na, yes, okay. Uh, 1 over Na is less than epsilon. You see it here. I can multiply across by a. I get n a bigger than one over epsilon. Therefore, one over n a must be less than the inverse of one over epsilon, which is epsilon. So, uh, in conclusion, we get that c to the n minus zero is less than epsilon for n larger than capital N. Okay, so that, that proves my statement here that c to the n goes to zero as uh, uh, n goes to infinity. Okay. One thing which is uh, obvious but uh, useful is the following, so property an converges to zero if and only if the an in absolute value converges to zero. Okay, so many times you are not quite sure about the sign of your sequence, or it's a sequence that oscillates, and you want to show that it goes to zero. Well, you can take the absolute value and work with a positive term sequence, which uh, many times is uh, easier. Okay. So that's uh, why this is useful. Uh, the proof of that really just uses the definition. So we have two implications to show because it's an if and only if uh, statement. The first one is that if, so assume a n goes to zero, then it means that for every epsilon there exists a capital N, so that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus zero is less than epsilon. Okay, uh, now uh, there is a, okay, so what we do then is write that a n minus zero is really uh, a n, and that a n is really absolute value of a n minus zero. Why is that true? Well, Subtract the zero, it disappears. You get absolute value of an. And then you do absolute value of absolute value. Okay, you can do as many absolute values uh, you like. Uh, once you have done one, it has no effect. So it's, uh, all these are true statements. Why am I doing this? Well, that's exactly the form I want to show that the absolute value of an goes to zero. Okay? Because this is equal to that, we have that. So absolute value of an minus zero is less than epsilon for n bigger than n. And that tells us that a n converges to zero in absolute value.
Okay, do you see the point here? You want to transform your problem in an in a problem in absolute value of an, and and that's the way to do it. It's to write that this is that, the same as that. And of course, uh, this step can be reversed. So to prove uh, the reverse application, you do exactly the same thing. So now assume that absolute value of an goes to zero. Then for every epsilon, we can find an n such that if n is bigger than capital N, then a n minus zero is less than epsilon. That's the definition of absolute value of a n converging to zero. But exactly for the reason which is there, this is also a n minus zero less than epsilon. Therefore, so a n goes to zero. So it's really writing, um, writing the definitions that give you that. But as you'll see, it's quite useful to know that. OK, so example, uh, first application of that. Let's look at this uh, uh, sequence. What's the limit of this sequence? Does it have a limit? So people get nervous usually because they see minus 1 over n. That oscillates between minus 1 and 1. However, the oscillation is killed by n. And this is going to converge to 0. And you can see it right away by saying, OK, absolute value of a n is 1 over n. You get rid of the minus 1 to the n by doing that. And that, we know, goes to 0. So a n goes to 0 as well. You always look so much cheerful in the beginning of a class that at the end that uh, I wonder if uh, no seriously am I doing things too fast or or do you know everything already and I'm boring you to death because uh, by the end of the hour it, it's not even an hour you look uh, pretty worn down so any suggestion or. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a generous explanation, thank you. So, but let me assign some homework for next week. So that will be September 14. Uh, the homework 